All right, all right, all right. If you could rejoin us here, we will finish off our evening with Mr. John Hodges. So if you, uh, yeah, I'm not going to do that to folks. All right, if, if um, so that we can give him a, his full hour here, um, we will finish off. I just want to say thank you to our two speakers. Thank you to Ken and thank you to John for being willing uh, to come down and uh, amidst their other projects. Also, uh, those of you who are in the room, if you wouldn't mind, you, those of you who have some uh, uh, youth and some strength uh, and some glory in that strength, would you help me with a few things after this? Would you um, help move this podium and uh, move the, uh, the piano and a few of our risers? That would be a good help to me, those of you, who, you young bucks. Uh, you know who you are. So, All right, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome once again for the final talk. He's bookending us first and last, uh, Mr. John Hodges. Thank you very much. It's always an honor to be here. Thank you, Jared, again for having me. Uh, I told him he's had me here now three years, you've learned everything I can teach. There's nothing else for me to teach you. So next year you'll probably have some other people maybe, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> although I understand maybe Lenora will come and play tomorrow, next year. That would be really wonderful if you know Lenora, uh, the organist, Lenora Morrow. What is her last name now? What's her? Uh, it just went out of my head. What is it? Oh, that's right, Jeff Coat. That's right, of course. Dear, dear girl. You know, it's been great to have Ken give us so much history and Bach's music uh, and uh, the precursors even to Bach's music. And he accomplished so many amazing things. But I can't help but think that even if he, in all of his talent, were born today, he wouldn't be able to accomplish what he accomplished in his lifetime. And that's because, it's no slight to him, it's because he would be born into a world that's very different than the one that he was born into. He, uh, <clears throat> he was really the end of an era when we do music history, you know, we, we end the Baroque period in 1750. And there's a very good reason why we call that the end of the Baroque period. It's because when J.S. Bach died, because he was the end of the period. He was the accomplishment of the Baroque. He was the greatest, the highest accomplishment of centuries and centuries of theologically oriented music. And it's a strange phenomenon. Of course, by the time he died, he was already a kind of a dinosaur, you know, in terms of style. Uh, the, the Rococo period had really started by the time Bach was, uh, well, the last 20, 20, 30 years of his life, uh, uh, his own children were writing in a new style of music that they called the Rococo. And, uh, and Bach himself uh, encouraged it. He thought that was a great thing. But he continued to write uh, really high Baroque music in the style of the old uh, styles until he died. Um, <clears throat> but it's an interesting phenomenon in music history that if you, if you think about the most famous composers before 1750, they were almost all associated with the church. Vivaldi was a priest. Um, Telemann, um, uh, Corelli, uh, the Italians like that, or Telemann, the German, or um, Heinrich, uh, Heinrich um, Schütz, or um, uh, Schein, and uh, uh, Buxtehude, and all of those fellows were all tremendous composers, but they were all associated with the church. 
And if you think about the, the musicians, the composers uh, from 1750 onward, the famous ones are people like Franz Joseph Haydn and uh, Wolfgang Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert and uh, Brahms and Wagner and on into the, you know, throughout the 19th century. And they almost to a man were not associated with the church, almost. There were some that were, Bruckner uh, and some others, but the, but the really top of the line famous composers are almost all not, Christ, not uh, associated with the church. That's not to say they weren't Christian, some of them were. Mendelssohn certainly was a Christian, but, uh, and Bruckner. Uh, but they weren't associated with the church. They weren't, being, they weren't being backed by the church. The church was the biggest uh, patron of the arts before 1750. And after 1750, it's the state for a while. It's the princes and dukes and kings that, uh, that uh, uh, patronize the, the musicians. The, the, one of the biggest patrons of the arts uh, in the 1700s, the 18th century, was uh, early part of the 18th century, was King Louis XIV, uh, Louis le, le Roi de Soleil, they called him, the, the Sun King. Uh, and he, uh, he uh, uh, patronized people like uh, Lully and others who were uh, opera composers and ballet composers, and he subsidized music, but he was the one that was doing it. It wasn't the church. The church was fading as a, as a, a, a main uh, pa uh, patron. <clears throat> and after the French Revolution, the patrons become the people themselves, the middle class. Even the aristocrats fall by the wayside for the most part. And by the end of the First World War, there really weren't any aristocrats left. By, set by 1918, uh, that's the end of the last of the aristocrats, the, the old Habsburg dynasties. So it's an interesting, interesting uh, phenomenon that the, the, with the death of Bach, we also have sort of this grand shift going on. And it's a philosophical shift. It's a uh, historical shift. It's a um, cultural shift in many ways. Anyway, the whole point is ben, uh, Ken was talking about the period of Bach and before. And I felt like my job was to try and explain why Bach wouldn't survive as the great composer that he was today. And it's because Bach was, at least with the Lutheran Reformation, standing on the shoulders of 200 years, basically, of uh, Christian, of, of uh, Protestant uh, music, in Germany in particular, but all around the world. Catholic music in Italy, of course. But if he were born today, Bach, with all of his grand abilities, would be standing on the shoulders of 250 years worth of enlightenment thinking, which for the most part sidelined the spiritual, it sidelined the, the church, it made, it put a wedge between, uh, between reasoning and faith. And it's a wedge that we in the classical Christian school movement. You all are, have a school here. I helped start a school in Memphis. I've been speaking about classical Christian ed for some years. Uh, what we've been do, trying to do is remove that wedge. It's a wedge that's 250 years old. It's very hard to reestablish the kind of culture that if given 250 years of, of time would then produce the kinds of people that we saw produced in the first part of the 18th century. But the seeds of that revol revolution, the seeds of that enlightenment thinking, uh, were in the works before Bach was born. And you find that, that the philosophies of the day precede the, the music. It's, you, can almost, you can almost watch in the modern world when an idea appears then a few years later you see it look, show up in literature and a few years after that in painting and a few years after that in music, you see. 
So by the time an idea is petering out in music, a brand new idea is already taking root in the philosophy and the literature and so on. So there's a kind of stair-stepped notion. And it seems like music always kind of comes up last, comes up as the latest, the last uh, influence. So if Bach were born today, he would have to overcome two and a half centuries of, of uh, secularization, if you want to call it that. I don't like that word so much, but the, the, uh, the elimination of the influence of revelation on the culture. It's not to say that they would argue that we don't reason. We do reason still, he would, they would say, up until recently. Uh, but it was reason as the summum bonum. It was reason as the highest good and not reason in the way that the medievals understood reason, which included intuition and the imagination uh, and especially revelation and the understanding of how it is that God's revelation metaphorically speaks. I, I'm going to unpack that word metaphor in a minute because I want you to understand it the way I mean it. Um, metaphorically speaks of the relationship between the material world and the spiritual world. The medievals understood clearly that reality was in two parts that way. There was the, the material world that you could see with the senses and there was the spiritual world that you couldn't see with the senses. But it was just as real. In fact, they might argue that it was more real because all of the material world depended on the spiritual, that is God himself, for its existence. And not only for its existence, but for its sustaining, its sustenance. So that's the world that we live in now. We have bifurcated, we have, we have divided the, um, the spiritual and the physical, and we've decided that the physical is real and the spiritual is at least less than real. It's, it's, um, it's uh, unimportant. It may exist, but it's unimportant. And the seeds of this are way back in the, in the 17th century, really, and especially take root in the 18th century. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out because what I'm hoping to do with this talk now is to go f forward and explain how we got to be where we are right now. And to do that, I want to tell you a little story. I was, uh, I was conducting a Bach cantata, studying and getting prepared for a performance of cantata number 32, in Memphis, about the same time that I ran into a, 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 a Presbyterian pastor who was asking me to come and help him uh, with music in his church. He wanted me to come and, and uh, do some coaching of his choir. Well, music in the church is not my first uh, area of, ex of expertise, it's certainly not an area of expertise, I wouldn't say. Uh, but I was interested in helping the church in any way that I could, and so I told him I would come. But when we had gotten to conversations about, um, about music, it was, it was really su surprising to me because here I was working on cantata number 32. Now, the text for cantata number 32 uh, is taken from uh, the Luke passage about uh, when Jesus was 12 years old and went to the temple, you remember, his family came, brought him into Jerusalem. And then on the way out of Jerusalem, they noticed he's not with them. And horror, you know, my, where's, my, where's my boy? I took over. Uh, and the, and uh, they searched and looked and everything until they went back to the temple and they found him in the temple. Well, this story is depicted in, in uh, elaboration a bit in uh, this cantata. And in the first movement, the soprano sings as though she were Mary, where are you? Where have you gone? Dearest Jesus, my beloved. Liebster Jesu, mein Verlangen, my, my beloved. Where are you, uh, dearest Jesus? And eventually her question, where are you, where have you gone, uh, I can't find you, that kind of de detail, gets reduced and reduced and to reduced until just she's just saying where, 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 wo, 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 like that. And the marvel of his music is that it is 
expressive about the lament of losing Jesus, and you relate to it because you realize it's a setting of this text from, from Luke. But by the time she's gotten to the point that she's just saying, where are you, where, where, you can't help but feel yourself in the, her position. So that you, the music itself sort of encourages you to think of the situation as you in search of God. God, where are you? So it's the human condition sort of embodied, you know, in this, in this first movement. Now here I am studying this and thinking, how does he shape this music to make this amazing transformation from simply setting a text to making it so pertinent and so, so real and so vibrant to the, to the people in the congregation listening to it? And then I had this conversation with this pastor and he said in our long conversation a sentence that has always stuck with me. He said, it doesn't matter what kind of music we do in our service as long as the words are biblical. Now, just think about all of the things you just learned from Ken about all of the detail, all of the intensity, all of the borrowing from things, incredible discernment about what tunes go with what words and all that stuff. <laughs> and then imagine that this fellow was not unusual in the pastorate. He was thinking, I just think music is a way to draw people into the congregation to hear the word, you see. The music doesn't it doesn't matter. You just pick whatever tunes, whatever style of music people like. And then, as long as the words are, are biblical, then I'm okay with it. And that's where I was going to go and work. <laughs> the, the contrast was so extreme, it was very difficult. So what do you do in a situation like that? What do you do? You go in there, here you are, you want to serve the Lord, right? And, and you have to... When you, go, when you go to a church service, it's not a concert hall. If it was a concert that they were asking me to do, well, then I'd just argue for excellent music and I'd put it on the way I intended to and I'd do it well and it would be, a, you know, a concert. And they'd take it or leave it kind of thing. But, but worship music is a very different animal. You're trying, it's music, obviously, but you're also including the congregation. It has to be something that... that that the congregation can use to draw uh, themselves closer to God, to recognize, a, uh, to, to, to offer a way to, uh, to express their love for God. It has to be uh, congregationally involved. And so I had to think about how I could choose music, not only that was excellently crafted, but also would, would be singable by people for whom uh, the idea that the music doesn't matter uh, was, was foremost, you see. Because the pastor was clearly, yeah, he was telling that to everybody. That's the way he thought about it. So let's just do what it is that people like and have done. Whew, it's a tall order. And I, I don't know how successful I was. I did, I did offer them a great number of things that I think were probably more... Uh, I don't know, challenging than they were used to. But my hope was that I placed in their hearts a love for or an interest in music uh, at, a, at a level that they hadn't thought of before. That's all. And, you know, once you're, I forget who said it, but once your mind has been stretched, it doesn't just snap back to its old position. You have to now live with the changes that come, you know. And so part of the job, I think, of the music director is to, to know his congregation well enough to be able to challenge them and draw them into an appreciation of something higher than wherever they are, wherever that is, and not see that lack of appreciation as sin. It's not sin. It's simple ignorance. It's a lack of understanding about music. Uh, but when you have to be very careful because suddenly they'll say, well, aren't you just being elitist? And I want to say, elitist in what way? <laughs> there are two ways. I remember uh, Peter, uh, Peter Kreft one time said, uh, the devil would have us be elitist about people and egalitarian about ideas. 
And of course, God would have us be just the opposite. Egalitarian about people, but unapologetically elitist about ideas, you see. And ideas, of course, are involved in choices of music. So I want to know what they mean by elitism. If they mean, well, you just like snooty classical music, well, there's lots to be learned, isn't there? So most people, I think, in our culture believe that music is either to enhance the mood of the time that they're in or to change their mood into something else, get you excited about your worship service, say, or what you play when you come home from work to sort of cool off after a hard day or something. In other words, I think they think that music basically expresses feelings. And what I'd like to do is explain a little bit about how it is that uh, aesthetics came to be uh, the study of the beautiful in the last 250 years and then compare that with uh, a medieval, a more medieval pre-enlightenment mindset. In the 18th century, Immanuel Kant, in the 19th century, Edward Hanslick, and in the 20th century, Robert, uh, Roger Scruton, uh, all Actually, with, uh, you, uh, Ken mentioned Suzanne Langer. That's a good uh, addition here. All of them, including Suzanne Langer, uh, wanted to get us out of that mindset that said we think that music is simply a matter of expression, of, of feelings. Now, what, what then would they argue it is an expression of? And most of the time, from Kant on, you hear the word form form in music. That's what it is. It's the expression of form. Well, why would form be worthwhile? And can you imagine how it is that with, for people who think, I just like listening to music, why would you want me to deal with form? Well, let me define the word form a little bit. The, the, the really, when we think about form in music, usually we mean something like the sonata form or the rondo form or the song forms or something like that. That is the shape of the music, and it includes that. That's true. But really, on the platonic side of form, the, the understanding of form, form is the invisible shape of something that we often craft material into in order to communicate that shape to one another. There are invisible forms, Plato would say, and uh, we, we take those things, those ideas, those things in our mind, those gl glimpses we get of, of, of a chair, say, and we then build a chair in accordance with that, and we compare the chair we make in the practical world with that idealized chair. But that idealized chair is what they might call the form. Well. God had an idea of his creation, and then he spoke it into existence out of nothing. I, I tell you a quick drop a, drop a name here. I was talking with Leonard Bernstein one time about this, and he said, in Hebrew, there are two words for the line, let there be light, in Genesis 1. There are only two words, and they are Light be. Isn't that cool? And, he's, and Bernstein said, and I think it ought to be sung. <laughs> and light bead. <laughs> he spoke it into existence. Well, as an artist, we create in a similar fashion, obviously not out of nothing, we're using the materials that God has given us. But we add something, we, uh, we, we have an idea in our head, and then we mold the material that we have in the world into that shape as best we can. For the medievals, the word art meant literally skill. They thought of somebody being an artist as someone who was skilled in a particular way of doing. I'm a good bricklayer, or I'm a good stonemason, or I'm a good carpenter, or I'm a good composer. Composers or musicians, violinists or whatever, were considered artists, but they were, what they meant by that was they had a skill. They could actually make the instrument do something that other people didn't know how to do. 
you see. It's just that. It's as simple as that. And art really should still be seen that way. We, In the 19th century, we made artists into priests and we made them into prophets, you know, and we sort of loftily raised them up and, and, and listened to them as though they had some sort of great insights. Well, in some ways they did, but to think of them as a replacement for God, of course, is a mistake. So the artist, though, does create out of his mind, out of his, out of his uh, ideas into the world in a material shape. And when I say artist now and I'm talking about skills, I'm talking about people who know how to grow flowers, people who can make a good meal, uh, people who can uh, uh, decorate a home, all sorts of things that we have ideas in our heads about how things might go and then we make those things happen in the real world. Uh, used to be human beings were known as homo faber, which means, well, maybe you can tell me, you Latin scholars, do you know what that means? Man the maker, man who makes things. That's how we are, that's what we do, we make things. And we make them in accordance with God's will, or we make them in accordance not with God's will. <laughs> we make them in other, other ways doesn't mean that we don't stop making them. So the material, the paint or the music, becomes the medium for the invisible idea to become visible and tangible and communicable. Does that make sense? There's an invisible thing that we then make into form, that we have a, a, an invisible form that we then craft the material into to be able to make that form, that understanding, invisible thing, clear to others, or even to ourselves. And the recognition of the connection between the material and the invisible thing, that spark of recognition, I think, is what we call the beautiful. It's seeing that thing and going, I get it. I get it. Like some of you last night, when I turned that, that uh, tune over, dong, da, 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 became dee, da, 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 da. And when you saw it, I saw light bulbs go off around. It was, it was exciting. That's exciting to me. That's what we mean by recognizing beauty. I can give you a quick example. This morning I had breakfast with several of my former students uh, at the Center for Western Studies. I run a program in Memphis called the Center for Western Studies and uh, we have a kind of tutorial education we do during a gap year, year between high school and college. And uh, uh, three of those students from last year were here in town yesterday and they invited me to breakfast this morning. And so I had a lovely breakfast and one of them, Clara, you'll know Clara, made this fantastic breakfast. It was glorious. It was, I could go on and on about it. I took pictures. I never take pictures of breakfast. I took pictures of breakfast to send to my wife so that you could see. Look how they're treating me. This is wonderful. And, uh, and her response was, they're welcome in my house any day. <laughs> but it was lovely. And Maria, one of the other students, recognized that, said, oh, what a lovely breakfast, right? This is really tasty. This is really beautiful. This is really nice. Well, only Clara herself knew whether it met her own standards, you see, because she was the cook. She had an idea in her head. She wanted to make the thing the way she wanted to make it. Well, it turns out it did come out the way she intended, and so she was very pleased with it. And she said, well, I guess I'm just being full of myself, but I think it was good. And I said, no, you're not being full of yourself. If you had it this way in your mind and it came out the way you intended, Praise God, that's a great thing. You've used your gifts to, to glorify him and you've made a beautiful thing. Well, here's what I'm, gonna, here's what I'm trying to say. The, the, the food was the medium that made it possible for Maria to be able to come into a kind of communion with Clara over this food. Does that make sense? Because she recognized the good in the medium the food in this case, and Clara was also recognizing the good in it, and it had come from her, the two of them had a kind of meeting of the minds, do you see? And that's what beauty does for us. I don't know if you've ever been to Paris, but I've been several times without my wife, 
And when I'm there without her, I don't like it as much. I see beautiful things and I want to tell her about it, you know, because I want that communion. I knew if she was here, she would really love this, you know. And that's part of our relationship. That's the beauty of our relationship. We're able to meet through the medium or the media of whatever we're looking at, the paintings at the Louvre or whatever. So <clears throat> I think that it, th- th- this, this, approach, this, approach, blah, 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 this way of looking, this approach to beauty is, is the way God intended for us to use that in order to have a kind of community, a building a community among us. And it's the way, too, that he builds community with us also. Because he's the one who made the material world to begin with. When he said, uh, you know, when Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I am the vine and you are the branches, the, they, they, what they heard was, yeah, I get vines and branches, that makes sense. But what does that have to do with you and me? And Jesus explains it to him. I'm the vine, you're the branches. In this metaphor, I'm the source of life, and if you remain in me and I in you, you too will have life, you see. And all the little light bulbs went off, and they felt that, ex- that understanding, of ex- that experience of, of this beauty I'm talking about, the connection between the material world and the spiritual reality that it points to. And then, if you think about it for a second, it all turns upside down. I think I may have told you this last time I was here, maybe two times back. Because the vine and the branch didn't happen accidentally. The guy that was saying, I'm the vine and you're the branches, is the guy who made vines and branches. You see? He's not only the redeemer, he's the creator, too. He's the one who built it that way. He made vines and branches to look like him. Well, that turns everything in the whole world, I think, upside down. If you start thinking like that, then you start thinking in what I'd call a sacramental view of the world, where everything that happens in the world, everything that is in the world, may have some kind of spiritual meaning that you can discern if you think through it as a Christian. I don't know that we would have doors in the world if it weren't for the fact that he was the door. I don't know. You see? Because he's the vine and we are the branches, he made the world to look like him. Kind of his thumbprint on the world. Well, if he can do that on a far smaller scale, can't we do the same thing? Can't we come up with something and craft Uh, something, music in particular, in a way that then conveys the idea that we have about things that we can't express other ways to each other and build our community that way. And back to the idea I gave you at the very beginning about Bach, if you have 200 plus years of uh, consensus about what the faith is all about, and then Bach comes into the world with all of his tremendous talents, which, by the way, he inherited from his family. His parents were musicians, his grandparents were musicians, his children were musicians. It was all running in the family. But when he steps into a position there with all of that consensus around him, he can do, he can, he's standing on the shoulders of giants, do you see? But what about if you're in the middle of the rubble kind of rubble that T.S. Eliot describes in the wasteland, the kind of rubble we found in the 20th century with 100, 000, 100 million uh, dead over uh, wars, communism and wars. What do you do in that case? How do you find ways to take two rocks and put them back on top of each other and begin to rebuild a cultural consensus that would properly evaluate and properly appreciate Uh, all of this idea of creation for the purposes of the glory of God. It's a tough, it's a tough job. And you young people are the ones that are going to have to do it. It's a, it's a job that we're passing on to you. We're not going to be around long. Christopher Dawson wrote, society is a historian. A society, quote, his society seems to have become one 
that will acknowledge no hierarchy of value, no intellectual authority, and no social or religious tradition, but will live for the moment in a chaos of pure sensation." End quote. Now, I think the romantic approach to music has been to expect the meaning of music to reach no further than a moment of pure sensation. If it asks nothing of me, that is, if I don't have to acknowledge any hierarchy of value, if I don't have to think or allow for other thinkers to sway my opinions, if I don't have to, excuse me, if I don't have to apply social and religious criteria, but can consume the music at the level of sensation alone, then all's fine. But if you're going to ask me to include any kind of authority outside myself, I'm going to balk. And I think that's the situation we find ourselves in today. The essence of our sinfulness is, in this case, to desire to be in charge of the definitions of everything. We don't want to be beholden to an external source of authority. We want to call our own shots. Since we experience God's authority as something that stands between us and our own wills, one of the manifestations of this attitude is that we inherently dislike, as Dawson says, hierarchy of value. In fact, if you, if you do a little looking around in the world today, the, even the word hierarchy is considered anathema. I told some of my friends the other day that I was going to be doing a podcast that I was going to call In Praise of Patriarchy. And they said, good luck. Because patriarchy is this horrible word these days. People hate that word. Anything that stands in the way of our experiencing life only through our personal preferences is considered oppressive. The work of the spirit that we call sanctification is in many ways the adjustment of our personal preferences to be in line with God's will. Thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. The work of the devil is to convince us that we don't need God's will and that we can achieve everything that we call happiness by adjusting the world to fit our preferences. If we can't deny God altogether, or if we want to disguise our rebellion as Christian, if we're kind of hedging, then we first need to reinterpret the scriptures to fit our preferences, and then we can go about changing the world to fit us, our preferences, all that we like. But the problem comes that to establish our preferences as the highest authority means that we will run into others who are intent on doing the same thing. And our preferences may, may, conflict, won't they? And life then becomes, as Hobbes said, nasty, brutish, and short. <laughs> as those conflicts lead, lead to their inevitable conclusions. So, finding meaning in anything is a spiritual activity, not just an intellectual one. And finding meaning in music is no different. Well, while we like to think that music expresses emotions, the truth is that it expresses these musical forms that we talked about yesterday. At least that's what we've been told. But I want to argue that Kant and Hanslick and even Roger Scruton, who I respect greatly, don't go far enough for Christians. They have a lot of respect for Christianity. Uh, Scruton certainly does. Um, but I don't think they understand the depth of what we're trying to accomplish. This, the, the appreciation of music is, in a sense, a two-step process. It's not just the appreciation of forms. It's that those forms heard in the case of music through our ears and lodged in our memory that way have to go through another filter, another filter that I call the imagination. It's a gift that God gave us to be able to interpret and value things. The imagination is a layer through which sensory stimuli, if you will, go for the purpose of seeing meaning in those stimuli, 
Our imaginations actually are a gift from God. A lot of times people don't like the word, Christians don't like the word imagination because it's been abused so much. I mean, we abuse our imaginations. We can read a, a, a verse in the Bible and take it out of context and imagine all sorts of crazy things about it and generate all sorts of bizarre uh, theology based on it. They say, no, 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 don't do that. Don't use your imagination. But that's not what the imagination's for. I'll just add to the fact that I'm talking about a baptized imagination, an imagination that is influenced at the core by the work of the Spirit. We assign some kind of value to objects all the time. That's the normal thing we do, and we do it through our imagination. We might find value in our favorite kind of pizza, or finding a lost iPhone, or hearing our, our girl say, I do, or seeing your child born, or even hearing God say, well done, thou, thou good and faithful servant. They're very different values, aren't they? I hope that they are. How do we decide which one to value most? Well, we inform our imaginations with something, with our upbringing, with our schooling, our friends, our books, our church, or the Bible itself, or a combination of all these things, or other things even. And that information informs us. And let me make sure you understand what I say inform. When we talk about information, I'm talking about it in the way that I talked about form a few minutes ago. You see, it informs, it takes things in our, in our imagine, or takes our uh, ideas and it forms them clearly in our minds so that we then can do the work of making, of faber, uh, being homo faber. And that information, information, this is, why, this is why information can't be, um, on, the, on the internet, can't become wisdom. You know the difference between information and wisdom? Have you ever heard this? They say information, knowledge, is knowing that a tomato is a fruit and not a vegetable. That's true. But wisdom is knowing that a tomato doesn't belong in a fruit salad. You see? So information can't necessarily give you wisdom. But... The informing of your imagination then can become a, a grid by which we properly value things. The, the entire year of our, of our uh, uh, center uh, year is, is based on the, on the idea of the ordo amoris, the ordering of your loves, something that, that uh, uh, Augustine talked about, and C.S. Lewis too, at that matter, quoting him. So the information of our imaginations comes through the incarnation. In him we have the model. The invisible becomes visible. Our art imitates the incarnation by taking the invisible idea and manifesting it in material form to convey it to another. The invisible, completely unknowable God becomes visible and walks among us. And he is not the only, only the representation of God. This is an important part about the incarnation. He's not just a representation of God or a picture of God. He is God. And so the representation, as it were, the incarnate body and the God that it represents are one. There's no separation between them. And I'm going to come back to that point because it's an important point in great art. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's no difference between us. In the same way, a truly artistic expression is the thing that it's speaking of. There are some things that we can't apprehend without this medium. It's what metaphors actually are. You know, a metaphor is a comparison of two things joined only by the verb to be. Right? Juliet is the sun. Not Juliet's like the sun. I am the vine. Not I'm like the vine. And then most importantly, this is my body. Now, 
that it becomes very complicated and mysterious if you press it. And I'm certainly not going to do that. But I kind of go along with C.S. Lewis when he talks about the communion, when he says, I'm grateful that the Lord said, take, eat, and not take, understand. Because you see, I can be obedient to take, eat. I can't be obedient to take, understand. It's beyond me. But in the same way, in the same manner, great things are accomplished by way of the arts. They take the invisible and they make it manifest. That's what metaphors do. And that's how it is, really, that we know God at all. Because even in his revelation, in his Bible, when we hear about the invisible God, he's always spoken of metaphorically. Have you noticed that? He's always a king or a father or a shepherd or a vine. But he is those things. He is those things in a way that nobody else is those things. Remember, the vine is secondary. He's the, he is the vine. The vine that we point at in the ground is the imitation. That's the imitation. See? So he can say, because he fulfills the idea of vine to such a degree, multifaceted degree, he can say, I am the vine, and point to that vine. Whereas the reverse can't be done. He, the vine can't say, I am God. You see? In the same way, art does this. And so if you're looking to find out what it is music means, it's possible that it means in the same way. That is, that you have an idea in your head and you craft the music into a shape to be able to convey it to someone else. And the music is the medium. The music is the breakfast, if you want to think of it that way. Now, I'm going to run out of time here, and I've got lots more to say, but I wanted to play you one more little example of music. It requires a little bit of explanation. Uh, it may be a tune you know fairly well. But in this, in this tune, the singer is singing uh, a prayer to God. And he's singing within an A major scale. Let me just do this over here. Can I run over here with this? Can you hear me, Phil? No? There we go. There we go. Okay, so that's an A major scale. And if I were to play that as a melody and leave it there, your ears want something more, don't they? They, they were waiting for that note. Well, knowing that, this composer wrote a melody that starts on the five and leaps up an octave like that. And then, so that's, if you count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, then it's five, 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 six, four, five, four, two, three, four, two, three, two, one, five, five. You with me? Those are the numbers. But once you've set up this A major, and the melody is reaching upward to this sixth, and finally to seventh, because it reaches up and up and up to seven, and never goes to eight. You never hear that final note. And you're, you find out throughout the whole song that you're unconsciously longing to hear that high note. He does it on purpose. And it's not until the very, very last note that you get that resolution. And it tells you something. It tells you something about his prayer. It tells you, without your knowing the future, that your prayer, his prayer has been answered. And it's going to be okay. And he's praying for his ward's um, beloved. Who's, who's on the, on the battlement, he's fighting this, this war. And, there we go. And the, um, everyone is asleep. And this guy sings this. His name is Jean Valjean. It's from the musical Les Miserables. 
And I got the chance to conduct 17 performances of this. And in our, my coaching of my Valjean, he wanted, he came in singing it, <clears throat> he came in singing it like this. God, I'll sing it down an octave because it's miserable if I don't for me. God on high, hear my prayer. In my need, you have always been there. That's what he's going to sing. Well, that's what he came in and sang in his first coaching. And I said, this is a song about longing, aching prayer up to God. You're begging him. You're begging him for the life of this boy. And he said, yeah, how can I get that begging in it? And I said, it's very simple. Don't breathe. So I got him to sing it like this. God on high, hear my prayer. All in one breath, you see. In my need, you have always been there. And when you sing it up in an octave, it's even more intense. And I had him sing it in falsetto. It's not really falsetto, but it is. It's the upper voice for the boy. For that. So it would be like, <clears throat> this is going to be awful. God on high. Like that. You see, it's not full voice. But he was a real lyric tenor, and he could sing that A, that E, in full voice if he wanted to. So I had this range, you see, in his ability. So what I wanted him to do was start off soft and sing it soft and plead and plead and get more and more um, uh, uh, confident and more and more pressured all the way through. So that by the end, toward the end, he starts singing those high notes in his real voice. You see? So it's not, um, God on high, hear my prayer like that, he finally goes, you can take, you can give, like that, you see, and it makes the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up, and this guy was a brilliant singer, opera singer, fantastic singer, I want to play you, not him, sadly, I don't have a recording that I can play you of him, but this is a recording of the greatest Valjean around, and he does all the things I'm talking about, and I'll point them out to you as they go. And what I want you to hear is how he doesn't sing the top note until the very end. Let's see. God on high, hear my prayer, in my need you have always been there. Is he is young. Now, 
chest voice. Can take, you can give, let him be, let him live. to redo something. How horrible. Come on now, don't mean, you don't mean to tell me that I've lost connection at that moment. That's horrible. Hold on a second, would you? I'll go back and play that end of it for you. Yeah, for some reason it cut out. What a shame. Okay, now let me go back a little bit. Let him be. Let him live. If I die, let me die. you. What on earth? Don't ever use YouTube. It's ter terrible. It's terrible. You guys are criminals. All right, I'm going to have to go back and play you the last phrase again because it's no good not going into it. That was a live performance too, so they really appreciated that. That's how it is that even a simple scale can, through your imagination and the words in the tune and so on, fit and, and express and mean something. It's quite apart from the words that those musical notes, that reaching for that high A, that reaching and reaching and never getting there, is a part of the, the natural tension of music, you see? And so music has the ability to express things like that. And when you add it to words that really uh, fit, properly fit, uh, you, have, you have something profound. Even in popular music like, like uh, Les Miserables. So, that's my, that's my talk. I want to thank you for letting me come, and I've enjoyed it very much indeed. Good night. Wilkinson, I'm assuming that's who we heard there. But, um, we are going to close with a song that's not in the same key, so you don't have to hit a high A, I guess, as it were. <laughs> but we're going to, uh, if you'll stand, um, uh, before we, uh, before we um, uh, close, uh, we'll sing. But thanks again, John. Thank you, Ken. Um, thanks for your attention. And students, uh, young and old, uh, learn as much and glean as much, and then get to dabbling where you can in little ways. Be little wee creators. Um, you don't have to write great works like that, but 
try your hand and uh, see what the Lord can do. We're going to sing one of the other, uh, uh, if you uh, will, hopefully those will be on the screen, uh, the What Air My God Ordains is Right. Ms. Davis will play uh, for us the, the other chorale tune that, um, since we've been taking Luther's chorale tunes, and this is arranged by Bach with a Catherine Winkworth translation. So if you'll stand and we'll sing that together, and then I'll pray, and we'll be adjourned. quick thing. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Melissa Cross and uh, Jenny and Tim Maney for their hospitality for our refreshments this evening. I, I forgot to do that. So let's thank them uh, for their work. Thank you. And if I might uh, have a little bit of uh, uh, grunt work after this is over, um, there will be an extra uh, gift in your stocking at Christmas time. But let's uh, close in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for uh, this time. Thank you for the, the work of uh, men like Luther and Bach and all of the, these men who've come downstream, uh, who you've given a song to sing and ability to craft and create. Help us to understand in little uh, glimpses uh, as much as you give us ability to, to go and do likewise and for your name to be glorified uh, in all of these things. Uh, bless us now, give us good rest, and uh, bring us back in due time that we might uh, continue this uh, great work of music and, and singing and learning about it together. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening.